So one of the big questions in biology is, why don't we live forever? Maybe one day we will, but until we understand why we grow old and get diseases such as Alzheimer's, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, we will not have a chance to greatly extend our lifespan. One of the main reasons for this is that currently we address one disease at a time. And even though we have breakthroughs in, say, cardiovascular disease, other diseases such as Alzheimer's are rather recalcitrant, very difficult to, right now, to prevent and cure. And so what happens is that we have the decline in one disease and in another the disease accelerates in its, in its frequency. And we're not living much longer than we did 10,000 years ago, unfortunately. So really what we're trying to do as a field, us biologists who study aging, is to understand what's at the root cause of this decline that we all go through unless we're unlucky enough to, be, to die early. So one of the major theories that's been around really since the 1940s, 1950s, is the idea that aging is caused by a decline in mitochondrial function. So what are mitochondria? Well, these, as many of you will have known from uh, high school biology, are the bags within our cells that generate chemical energy. They do other things. They process fat and also allow us to, to make other molecules that allow for cells to grow. But really, for this topic, what we want to talk about is their role in making chemical energy called ATP. And I draw this like a bag with my hands. It's really just a, a double membrane. The inner membrane is ruffled. And there are lots of proteins within that bag that carry out these chemical reactions to make ATP and energy. Now, what's really interesting about mitochondria is that they're actually another organism living within our, our, each of our cells. And unlike the textbooks, there isn't just one or two mitochondria per cell. There's hundreds, in case, some cases thousands of these. Um, and they're not just single bags, they're actually networks in there. We're learning that they, they divide and then they fuse and then they, they can the cell can destroy the bad ones and improve the healthy ones. There are some unfortunate people throughout the world who have mitochondrial diseases. And when the mitochondria don't function well from birth, uh, Patients tend to have a number of neurological disease, uh, diseases, traits, and there are other muscle, uh, loss of muscle functions as well. So mitochondria are critical for life. We know that. In fact, if you poison the mitochondria, say with cyanide, uh, you'd be dead within about 30 seconds. So we really need to understand not just how mitochondria function, but how to keep them healthy throughout our life. And one of the main theories of aging is that over time, well, we start out young and there's lots of mitochondria and they're healthier and they know how to function. They make lots of energy. We feel great. We've got energy. We can run. We can fight off diseases. Our brain functions well. We can remember and we don't get diabetes. We don't have dysfunctional muscles, for example. But over time, let's say people like me who are now midlife, we are starting to lose our mitochondrial function. That's a fact. And then by the time we're in our 60s and 70s, it's even worse. And an 80 to 90 year old will have much, much lower mitochondrial function and they'll have less ATP. And this is a problem. And we scientists think that one of the major causes of diseases during aging is caused by this loss of the ability of our cells to make energy. Now, as I mentioned, mitochondria are free living organisms in our cells. They joined our cells about 2 billion years ago. They were originally what are called alpha proteobacteria. We find these free living bacteria right now in the world, but they're genetically related and functionally related to our own mitochondria. And what's important is that these mitochondria have their own DNA. They brought their own genome with them when they joined our cells to make eukaryotes. And today they still have many of those genes in their genome. The other genes that used to be in, in that genome, it's a circular genome, have been transferred to the nucleus. Uh, and so we're really just a, a mishmash of two species living together. And the genomes exist um, separately, but they need to communicate very well together to maintain their coexistence and be healthy. And later I'll tell you that one of the problems with aging might be that these two genomes within our cells lose the ability to communicate. But first of all, I want to tell you about an older theory of aging um, that still holds some weight. But what we're starting to think is that this is more of a later stage of aging. So back in the 
40s and 50s, I was telling you that the mitochondrial theory of aging was born. And that's the idea that during metabolism, there's a lot of free radicals, or we call these reactive oxygen species that can damage macromolecules. The idea is that as the mitochondria, when we're young, are functioning, they're producing these free radicals that damage the enzymes, and particularly the DNA within the mitochondria. And over time, we start to lose uh, the code that's in our mitochondrial DNA. We get mutations, we get big deletions. So for example, if we took my DNA from pretty much any cell, except perhaps my germ cells in my testes, these cells would have a large number of mutations and deletions already, which is rather disturbing. And the idea is that if we could slow down this damage to our DNA, we would have a way to delay aging. We could prevent these mutations and we would actually be healthier to, into long and have a longer life. Now this theory still had, has some merit. You can find these mutations in, in any body, even newborns have some mutations already, so, which is a scary thought. One of the problems with the theory has been that the ability to extend lifespan by slowing down these mutations has been rather a, a difficult uh, battle. We haven't really had success feeding antioxidants to mice, for example, or other organisms. It hasn't had a big impact on their lives. And in fact, one of the, the new theories is that free radicals might be somewhat beneficial and can extend the lifespan. If you take a little worm, for example, and give it antioxidants, that can actually have a negative impact on its long life. So it's not as simple as we once thought. Where the field is settling now is that the damage to mitochondria does occur. It seems to be important, but it might be most important for the later stages in life. Let's say after you're 50, 60, 70. But what's going on in someone like me who's 40? What's, why am I already experiencing a decline in my mitochondrial function? Well, it may not be to do with mutations. And the reason is that we have found just recently studying mice and, and uh, human cells is that if you catch aging early enough and the mitochondrial dysfunction early enough, it's actually reversible. One of the, the new leading theories in aging and mitochondria is that the communication between the nucleus and the mitochondria breaks down early during aging. And let's call that stage one of aging. Now what what carries out this communication is that, so if we have the nucleus here and the mitochondria here, there are proteins that are made in the nucleus by our main chromosomes, and those proteins travel across the cytoplasm into the mitochondria, and they help the mitochondria be healthy. They, they make it make just the right amount of energy to match what the cell needs. And what we found is that during aging, in the early stages, this communication, these proteins that move across to the from the nucleus to the mitochondria, they start to lose their activity and you don't have as much made anymore in the cells. Now the good news now is that if we could restore that communication, we might have a chance of reversing aspects of aging if we catch it early enough. Now the analogy that I like to make is that the nucleus and the mitochondrial genomes, these two genomes, are like a married couple. When they move in together early, they're, they're in love, they communicate well, they talk, they share ideas, and that's what our cells are like when we're young. But over time, they don't, they don't talk as much, they develop different interests, and what happens is they, they stop talking over time. And we know that that's the worst thing that can happen for a marriage. And we think the same thing happens for the marriage of these two organisms, these two genomes in our cells. And what our job is now, is to test what happens if you can restore that communication again and that the, get them talking again. And just uh, in December of 2013, our lab published a, an interesting paper that showed the following. It showed that one of the main causes of miscommunication is that the nucleus doesn't think it's getting enough energy anymore. And it doesn't, it doesn't send the signals to the mitochondrion to make them produce the energy anymore. We tracked this down to the loss of a, a small molecule called, 
called NAD. We think NAD is critical for cells health and their ability to maintain this healthy communication. So what we did was we simply raised the NAD levels back up in a mouse to their youthful levels. So a mouse, when it's young, has, let's say, this amount of NAD. Over time, the NAD levels drop by half. And we found, well, first of all, we, we asked the question, if we raise these levels back up to youthful levels of NAD, what happens? Can we restore this communication? And we did that. The, the way you do that, actually, is quite simple. You inject a mouse with a molecule that the, the animal turns into NAD. You can buy this from a chemical company. You inject it for a week. And we asked, does this have a benefit restoring the communication? And the answer was yes. Now, after one week of raising NAD, the nucleus was now re-establishing re communications to the mitochondria. They were talking again. And then we could ask, does this improve health? Does it restore the energy of the cell, which we think is a cause of aging? And the answer was, quite remarkably, yes. The, m the mice, when we looked at their muscle and their heart, they had a restoration of youth. The mitochondria were revved up again after just a week, and they were making energy. And as far as we could tell, looking at all these functional assays of the mitochondrial activity, their ability to make energy, their genomes activity, the amount of DNA they had, they went straight back to being young again. So we actually couldn't tell the difference between a two-year-old mouse and a six-month-old mouse. What that really is like is saying, we could take a 50, 60-year-old human muscle and make it like a 30-year-old again. Now, I mean, that would be great if it's true in humans. We only know in mice so far, but we are gearing up to test this in humans. We think that if we could give this molecule that raises NAD in a pill or an injection, we think that, with, that within a week, if we're right, then we could reverse aspects of aging in humans. And that would be something really quite spectacular. And if we can do that, there's a possibility that we could actually not just see people get old and, and experience diseases and slow down one disease at a time with, with t traditional medicines. We might be able to actually if we catch the, this event early, we could reverse mitochondrial aging. And if everything turns out to be correct that I've said, then what we expect is that humans will not develop diabetes, even cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's until much later, maybe into their 90s, hundreds or further. And so that we're looking at a future where we might be able to restore youthful energetics in cells, prevent mitochondrial aging, keep this organism within our bodies healthy, and live much longer, healthier lives.